The international longshoremen go on strike, idling 45,000 workers and potentially the U.S. economy. But are we obligated to freeze technology in order to preserve jobs? I'm Scott Ott with Bill Whittle and Stephen Green. This episode of Right Angle is brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. Gentlemen, the thing you're hearing about mostly in the strike is the fact that the Longshoremen's uh, Union was demanding, as a condition of sitting down to talk, a 77% pay increase over the next uh, six or seven years, and that the uh, the companies had offered 50% and nobody was sitting down. Since then, I've heard, and this is fluid, and by the time you see this, it'll probably be outmoded, but it crawled up to like 61%, and maybe they were going to sit down. But what struck me about this story, Stephen Green, I watched a video of the president of the Longshoremen's Union, who sounds exactly like you would think a cartoon union boss would sound from like the 1940s or something. And And or a mobster. He was bragging about he, how his guys could shut down the country, basically. And he was talking about salaries, but the thing that really seemed to have him cheesed off was automation and artificial mm-hmm. intelligence yeah. and the potential of those two in conjunction with each other to eliminate their sweet jobs uh, with an average wage once you get a couple of years under your belt of about $39 an hour with overtime and stuff like that. Many longshoremen are making six-figure income comes, uh, that th- the amount is irrelevant. Stephen Green, are businesses obligated to freeze the advance of technology that would make things more efficient and that would lower their costs in order to keep a commitment to employees of perpetual uh, jobs because uh, they should value people more than their greedy desire to reduce expenses? You know the danger is in declaring how in a sen- how how essential you are is that you go on strike and people find out that you really aren't, and and hopefully this is what we're looking at here. I have no beef with the longshoremen themselves, but if you if you look at a, a Chinese longshoreman and China moves, you might be aware of this a lot of goods in and out of that country. Uh, They don't have a whole lot of raw materials. That's goods that got to come in. They produce a whole lot of exports. That's goods coming out. And if you look at their at their major shipping ports, their longshoremen are guys at computer terminals using 5G wireless and Mm -hmm. AI and automation and nobody gets dirty and the product moves. Stuff comes in efficiently, stuff moves out efficiently. You order that uh, it doesn't matter what you order out of China, it gets out fast. Um, and we should be able to do that. I, it, it boggles my mind that we are using essentially 19th century procedures in our ports when we could be using 21st century technology that China is already already using. And no, nobody has the right to do this. Nobody has the right to shut down the country for what what, what was it they wanted a 77% raise over yeah, 5 Yeah, that's yeah. just 5 just six to years. sit down and chat we wanted that commitment. Uh, yeah. Uh, plus uh, no innovation. Innovation built this country. Trade built yeah, this yeah, country. Yeah. We have been a maritime trading nation since before we were a nation. A big reason that we fought the revolutionary war was London was screwing with our trade. You can't do that. We are a free trading people, and the oceans have always, always been our friends. And that means the docks got a hum. And the way you hum now is through 5G and automation and the idea that a few tens of thousands of people have some sort of God-given right to a particular job and a particular income, and they can beat the rest of us up until they get it. No, no. Nobody has that right anywhere in this country. And what's the real kicker here? I don't know if you saw this. What's the uh, the, the post-war labor law the, the Republicans passed? Taft, Taft-Hartley. Uh, Taft, Taft-Hartley. Thank you, yeah. Taft-Hartley. Uh, Joe Biden was asked, this is the, a day or two before the strike began on Tuesday, if he was going to use uh, his power to compel the workers to negotiate and to go back to work in the meantime. And the President of the United States, the chief executive of the laws of the United States, said, I don't believe in Taft-Hartley. It's the law of the land. 
He doesn't believe in it. So Joe Biden's going to let his buddies shut things down in the weeks before, the, the couple of months before Christmas. And by the way, there's a funny video that uh, the longshoremen, you'd expect, oh, you know, union guys, hardcore Democrats. You ask them, and they are blaming Kamala Harris and her tie-breaking votes for the bout of inflation that we've suffered these these last few years. But the thing is, the next round of spike hikes, if this if this strike goes on, it's on them. Well, Bill Whittle, um, the the longshoreman's president is expecting that Joe Biden, uh, surprisingly, a politician uh, would go back on his word. He's expecting him to invoke Taft-Hartley and forcing the longshoreman to go back to work for 90 days at some point. Uh, you know, he he thinks the country. Uh, he, the first week, he said it'll just be news stories, but once you start getting to the second week, then things will start cars, to become car salesmen start shutting more down. More Yes, risk. exactly. Yeah. Um, and so I was talking with a. A, a representative from a, a household goods supplier this week who said uh, that he thinks that containers uh, shipments are going to go back up to where they were in COVID, about $20,000 per container for shipping just because of the, the shortage and difficulty of getting stuff here. Any, anything that has to come in now has to come in on the left coast um, because everything's shut down from New England to Houston. Uh, but, but Bill, the president can invoke those 90 days, but the longshoreman president guy said, basically, oh, well, then we're going to slow roll it. You, 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 you took course. this is exactly yes. what I wanted to talk about. So you can you can make us uh, you can make us go back to work, but you can't make us work. Uh, Bill, this uh, combined with this idea that I, I, if you've seen any video of the way docks operate now, I mean, it's like watching something from Star Wars. There are these right. there are these robotic vehicles moving around carrying containers right. on them and it's just fascinating and amazing and should be celebrated but somehow the un well somehow the union's future is completely dependent upon keeping union membership up. I'm not blaming the individual union worker. I'm saying that the unions themselves yeah. have to have these masses of workers or they lose their power and and Bill, it just seems to me you can't operate a free market economy if people are forced to say, yes, I will employ you in perpetuity, even though I have technology that can do it better, faster, cheaper than you. I couldn't agree more. And um, going into this uh, thing with as much of an open mind as I could possibly have, given the fact that my father's a hotel manager. So you know, I've always been, um, I was just raised to be on the other side from unions in, in, in most of these things. But yes, um, when he said we need a raise and so on, and I'm looking at the cost of inflation and so on, I said, okay, it doesn't seem unreasonable. This is hard physical work. Then then he gets into, um, here's how we'll cripple you. And I'm starting to think, I'm liking you a lot less. But the thing he said that absolutely blew my, my stack was he said, you can order us back to work. And instead of doing 30 cycles an hour, we'll do eight. Yeah. I thought, okay, okay, you know what? There are machines that'll do 30 cycles an hour, whether they're angry or not, because they don't get angry. In fact, they'll probably do 60 cycles uh, an hour. And the faster we make them, the more cycles they'll do because they just don't care. Um, and I just ended up thinking, and, and by the way, all of the comments on the on the X thread that, that had that union leader's speech were, were pretty much the same thing. Okay, great. Give them the money, pay them, get them back to work, and then and then automate them out of existence. Hmm. Just automate them out of existence. And and the thing you mentioned, Steve mentioned as well, it's actually hard to imagine anything easier to automate than container shipping. It, it really is just stacking Lego blocks. They have to use computers in order to load and unload the ships anyway because they have to get the most efficient way to get what needs to get out first, out first. In in World War II, we would call this combat loading, where the first things that, that, that were needed on the beach when, when the supplies went ashore had to be packed last so you could get them off first. So this this not only is, um, is overdue for automation, it's hard to imagine anything easier to automate. We're in a, in a stage now where uh, my friend Bert Rutan has a uh, self-driving uh, Tesla, which he never fails to demonstrate to me, <laughs> and it does a st astonishingly good job, and that's out there amongst the idiots. Uh, <laughs> having had primary flight training in uh, Torrance Airport, I've spent a fair amount of time uh, at relatively low altitude over Long Beach, which is I think our major port of entry for, for most of the goods that come into this country. And it is nothing but a giant construction set, Scott. 
It's, it's huge cranes that move to a pre-programmed position. A computer moves to where it needs to be, picks up the container it needs to be picked up on, puts it on the back of a, of a truck. And then you see what's happening in places like Shanghai, where these containers are moving around on automated um, carriers. And you just think, I'm embarrassed that, that we've got humans driving this in the first place. It makes me feel like, you know, like, oh, oh how quaint, you know. Maybe you'll show me your, your wagon wheel manufacturing facility or, or your or, or where, where, where do you process your baleen? Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's like Mercedes going back to make buggy whips. Yes, exactly. So so S- Steve said, you know, one of the dangers about talking about how um, essential you are to the economy, one of the dangers is that you, you go on strike and people find out that you're not really that badly needed after mm. all. But another one of the dangers is you go on strike and people realize, no, our entire lives depend on these this mean-spirited, you know, chip on my shoulder, you know, striding macho um, uh, D-bag who was essentially bragging about the amount of pain he's going to cause people because when I get my men back to work, even if we're forced back to work by the law, we'll just go through the motions. You know what? You go right through the motions. You continue on with your union, continue on with your with your union blackmail and all the rest of it. And you have essentially just put yourself out of business. You just don't know it yet. There's a, a line in the movie Air Force One where the president's character played by Harrison Ford um, says, we will not negotiate with terrorists. We don't negotiate with people who take hostages. And that's the way this feels right now. I'm not saying that there aren't some legitimate grievances that the workers might have. I'm not saying that they don't deserve higher pay, that their wages might have been stagnant uh, through all this time. I'm just saying I wouldn't be part of an organization that had that union president as its spokesperson telling the country basically, you are our hostages and you will cave and we will win because uh, three fifths of all trade will be cut off and you will suffer until we get what we want. And he's not shy about saying this. But the really disturbing part of it, I think, is this idea that somehow we can we can stop the hands of time and freeze innovation going forward. All of human history is the story, especially in the last 150 to 200 years, is the story of man's effort to make life less burdensome. Um, and it's ironic, I think, that this is happening right now because I'm reading a book uh, called How Innovation Works by Matt Ridley. And one of the chapters in this book is about um, shipping containerization. And the guy who came up primarily with this idea, although many people were involved in its genesis and evolution over the years, um, but the, the ships used to have to be loaded basically by pieces. And it took mm-hmm. weeks to load a ship. And ships were much smaller than they are now. With the advent of containerization, um, you're able to load a ship that's much bigger in three days instead of three weeks, and you, you gain a lot of other benefits. You can use larger ships, you can use less fuel, you can move faster, you can reduce the cost of shipping, therefore reducing the cost of products to people, as well as making it easier for companies shipping overseas from the United States to make a profit because it's cheaper for them to do the shipping there. and it's much safer for the longshoremen. The technology has made it much safer. Well, you know how longshoremen greeted the advent of containerization back then? They went on strike. They went on strike and they slowed things down and in some cases damaged things because they didn't wanna see that happen because they didn't want their jobs to go away. And this has happened in so many industries, and I don't know why they can't read the, I think they do read the history, but they read the history as this, the greedy fat cats always win, but they're not gonna win this time. But then the greedy fat cats win because it's not the greedy fat cats that they're fighting. It's the American people. It's the American destiny that they're fighting. It's the American spirit of innovation that they're fighting. Instead of saying, hey, things are changing. Technology is changing everything. I've got an iPhone in my pocket and I'm telling my employer that he can't use an automated system to load a ship. What am I, insane? (laughs) 
So I, I would say to my to my friends out there who are longshoremen, I know all of you are not on board with what the guy who's the union president is saying, um, but I, I would ask you within your job context to in, in inject some sanity. I would also encourage you to equip yourself for the inevitable future. Look at the trajectory of everything. Now, how many of you want to go back to a telephone that is bolted to the wall in the kitchen with a six foot curly wire connected to it? Nobody, nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to go back to a day when each piece had to be loaded onto a ship individually. Containerization is here to stay and automation is here to stay. And it's pretty likely that large language model artificial intelligence features that allow you to more effectively and efficiently load a ship are here to stay as well. Get on board with that, be a leader of that, and train yourself for a job that pays more than the job you're getting now. And to the hostage taker who thinks that he can make this demand just without blushing, without humiliation, he should be, he should be kneeling in the driveway of the American people, apologizing and threatening to stick a sword in his own belly when he speaks like this. <laughs> to you, I will just say what Harrison Ford's character says, we will not negotiate. Maybe the president will, but the American people will not. And time will pass you by, as will we, on the way to fulfilling our dreams, since you've decided that your workers don't deserve their own. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making Right Angle possible.